Good. I, I love that song. I, I love what it says in there. Nobody greater, nobody higher. No one, no one, no one. He's worthy of our worship this morning. Amen? We're here to praise his name. There's, there's no one like our God. No, no one that compares to him. He's amazing. He's unique. And he's so amazing, he's so unique that that one name can't capture who he is. And so in his holiness, in his majesty, in his provision, in his might, in his goodness, it, it can't be captured in one name. So he's given us more than one name for us to know him by, for us to understand more and more, little by little, of how awesome he truly is. Uh, We saw last week as we looked at the name Jehovah or Yahweh, which we looked at in week one, that sometimes in Scripture we have two names that are put together. So like Yahweh or Jehovah, which which means I am that I am or the all-sufficient one. And we saw last week Jehovah, Jireh, or Yahweh, Yireh the combination and because God is the all-sufficient one he's also the one though that's our gyra he's he's our provider that we looked at last week but there's so many more names for us to discover he's not just Yahweh or Jehovah Jireh he's not just the God who provides or the God who sees to it this week we're going to learn that he is El Rai now, some people look at this and pronounce it, and uh, it's okay if, if you want to pronounce it Elroy, but Elroy just kind of sounds like an old man and doesn't really help us maybe to give God the recognition that he deserves, okay? But Elroy might be helpful for some, and, and I know some that have used a, a, a way to, to remember what this name actually means by connecting the name Elroy to somebody else and it helps them to to remember that the definition and the understanding of what we're going to discover today when we talk about El Rai but El Rai is how I understand it to be best pronounced but when, when you say see two words together and we haven't talked about El before Last week we talked about Jehovah Jireh and and we had already talked about Jehovah and so we had a little bit of an understanding. When you see El Rai, you see El at the front of something. How many of you had Spanish class? How many of you, you know a little bit of Spanish? Like Taco Bueno. (laughs) But we, we look at the word and we see El and in Spanish El means the. So like El Perro is the dog, right? El Patron is the boss. Some of you are thinking some form of alcohol, but El Patron is the boss. Well, El in this case is not so much the, although there is an indication it's part of the answer. But El goes back to another name for God that is given in Scripture, Eloaha, which is a name for God, the God. But then there are different names that take that and they use just the first two, El, E-L, and then give a kind of a descriptor of this is the God so there is the in it, but the L is the God. And then Ra'i. So what's the Ra'i part of the God? So this isn't just any God. This is the God. But it's a specific part about God that we're going to learn about today. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 16. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can grab one of the KDBC Bibles. It's page 10 love for you to be able to follow along. I actually referenced what we're going to look at today last week when we talked about Jehovah Jireh. 
And I said last week that there was a time in his life that Abraham didn't fully understand the Jehovah Jireh, that God is the provider. And God had given Abraham a promise, and there was a time in his life where he thought he needed to help God out. What usually happens when we try to help God out? We, we get into a problem, right? How many of you have tried to do God's job for him? And how well did that go? Okay, so he's, he's, he gets the idea, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but he, he tried to do things on his own. He didn't understand that God was Jehovah Jireh, right? He, he got impatient. His wife got impatient. They're getting up in age. They don't have a child yet. God had promised that Abraham would be made into uh, uh, many nations. I'm, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. That was God's promise. Abraham still hadn't seen a son. So Sarah gets the idea, well, why don't you take my servant as your wife, and you can have a child through her, and that will be our child. We'll help God fulfill the promise. Well, it caused a lot of problems, which we're going to uncover, we're going to see, as we look at Genesis chapter 16. She's pregnant, and things get really, really bad. When she, the she that we're talking about here at the beginning is Hagar. Okay, so Hagar is Abraham and Sarah's slave. When she knew she was pregnant, she, Hagar, began to despise her mistress, Sarah. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. I'm going to pause just for a moment here to point something out. It doesn't really tie into today's message in the name of God that we're looking at today, but it is a, it's an important lesson that we all need to be aware of. Whose idea was it for Abraham to take Hagar as his wife? To have a child with Hagar. Whose idea was it? Sarah. But what is Sarah saying here? Whose fault is she saying it belongs to? She's blaming Abraham. You are responsible. It's your fault. Now, did Abraham have to listen to his wife? Wives, be careful. <laughs> he didn't have to go along with it, right? He, he could have been the man of God and said, no, God said that he would do it. We're going to let him do it. But Abraham went along with it. Here's the thing I want us to see, and I'll move on and get to really what I want to get to today. No one wins when we play the blame game. No one wins. No one wins when you play the blame game. That's an important lesson that we need to know, but that's not the lesson that I'm going after today. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. I've highlighted the word found for a reason. I, I went and I looked at about 40 different translations to see what word they use here for found. Can, can I get behind it? I, I looked up the Hebrew word for what's used here too to, to get a better understanding. And here's what I learned in the 40 different translations, all but two of them use the word found or a derivative thereof. So like find or finds. And there was one that used the word, and it wasn't the King James Version, but it sounds like it came from the King James Version. There was one translation that used the word findeth. And then findeth just rolls off the tongue, and that sounds good, but, but there was two translations that, that did not use the word found or a derivative thereof. One is the Good News translation that said the angel of the Lord met Hagar. And then the contemporary English version says while she was there, the angel of the Lord came to her. 
I like this one the best. Now here's the thing. All of the other translations are fine. If you go back to the Hebrew, the word found that we have mostly translated in English is the word that's typically perfectly fine. Okay, No problem with the translation. I just personally think that this captures the idea that the angel of the Lord, and we actually see that this is God, came to her better gives the understanding of what actually took place. For instance, how many of you have ever found something that you weren't looking for? We've all found something that we weren't looking for, right? You, you found a penny in the Walmart parking lot. Were you looking for that penny in the Walmart parking lot? When you, when you went to the store, were you thinking, you know what, I'm going to try to find a penny today. Now, there may be somebody that did that. I don't know. But I'm guessing the majority of us never woke up and thought, you know what, today I'm going to go to Walmart so I can find a penny. But yet we found a penny. What we see as we continue in this passage of Scripture is that God didn't just accidentally come across Hagar. He, he didn't just go... It wasn't even so much as like lost and found, like hide and go seek. Like that kind of find. He came to her. He knew where she was and he came to her. He found her. Doesn't imply that he had no idea where to look. And it doesn't imply that it was coincidence. We see as we continue to learn more about El Rai. Verse 8. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. A couple things that I want to point out, and we'll move on, but first thing is we see that God does with Hagar the same thing that God did with Moses in week one of the series and what God did with Abraham last week in week two of the series. He begins by calling them by name. He called Moses by name. He called Abraham by name. And here he begins by calling Hagar by name. Why is that important? It's important because every name means something. And here we see that every name means something to God. And for us to know that our name means something to God. As we continue to learn about El Rai. And it was important to Hagar that Hagar knew that God knew her name. Another thing that I want to point out in these two verses is that God never asks a question that he doesn't know the answer to. Okay? It's really, really important that we understand that. God never asks a question that he doesn't know the answer to. He's omniscient. He, he knows everything. And we get a glimpse of that in the name El Rai as we continue in the passage. But I'll just point out that God knows exactly where she's coming from and he knows exactly where she's going. And I'll point it out by saying, pointing to Hagar, servant of Sarah. So where did she come from? She came from Sarah's place, right? God knew that already. Where, are you, where have you come from? I, he knows that. He just wants her to answer. And where are you going? Does God know where she's going? Absolutely. He knew exactly where to find her. He knew what road she'd be on because he knew where she was headed to. He already knew the answer to this. Important for us to understand that because he's El Rai. As we continue in the chapter, we see that God gives her three things. God gives her a promise. He gives her a proclamation. And he gives her a prophecy. He gives her a promise that he's going to increase her descendants that they will be too numerous to count. He gives her a proclamation. 
by telling her that the son that she carries, that he should be called Ishmael. Why Ishmael? Because every name means something, and Ishmael means the God who hears. And so Hagar is going to have a, a daily reminder in the presence of her son that this God that she's speaking to is the God who hears her. The third part of that, the prophecy, the Lord tells her that Ishmael will grow up to be a wild donkey of a man and that he will live in conflict and hostility toward his brothers. If you follow the lineage and know anything about Ishmael, you know that Ishmael's descendants comprise a large portion of those in the Middle East. And there's a lot of unrest and hostility towards one another in the Middle East. We see the, the fulfillment of that prophecy even yet today. We pick it up in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. El Rai. So as we look at the name El Rai, what, what does the name El Rai mean? It means the God who sees. El, the God, Rai, who sees. Not just a common name for God, a very specific name, the God, Eloa, Rai, the God who sees. Hagar had heard about, Hagar had knew that God was the God. But now she understands that he's the God who sees her. His name is above all other names. And this may be the name of God that you need above all other names. Especially in this season. To know that God is the God who sees. Well, it takes us to a question. What does this name tell us about the God behind the name? Two things that I want us to see here. Number one, God oversees those who are overlooked. God oversees those who are overlooked. Hagar was overlooked, right? Hagar was a slave. Did Abraham and Sarah consider Hagar's feelings, Hagar's thoughts, Hagar's desires? Not, not at all, right? They didn't see her as a person. They saw her as property. They saw her as a means to an end. A way to get what they wanted. And in the end, she meant nothing to them. But God shows up. And Hagar understands that God is the God who sees her. He's the God who oversees those who are overlooked. That he paid attention to her. Friends, I want you to know this. God sees you. You may feel like you're overseen. I mean overlooked. Know that God sees you. Know that God sees you. He's the El Roy. He's the mighty one. The God who oversees those who are overlooked. The, the second thing that Hagar sees about God and that we can learn about the God behind the name is that God sees us for who we are, who we really are, and who we are meant to be. If we go back to where we get El Rai from, she says, you are the God. I have now seen the God who sees what? The God who sees me. Not just that he's El Rai, El Rai, he's the God who sees, but he's the God who sees me. Hagar sees that God sees her for who she really is. This is, this is important. God sees her in her pain. God sees her in her loneliness. 
God sees her in her brokenness. God sees her. He came to her amidst all of this. He saw her. And he comes to her. But he not only just saw her in her brokenness and her pain, he didn't just see her for who she was. It's also important that we see that he saw her for who she was and what she had caused and her part of that. It can be easy to overlook something that we have in God's Word But as we began our passage today, began looking at the passage today, it started with she, and it talked about her despising and how she acted towards somebody. And it wasn't, didn't start with how Sarah treated her. It started with how she treated Sarah. She had a part in this. And, and we see in Hagar and Sarah, we see a, a truth that somebody has captured as this. Hurt people hurt people. And we've got this, this continual action of, of somebody that's hurting, hurting somebody else. Sarah is hurting because she has not had a child yet. She mistreats Hagar, right? Treats her as a slave, like, well, you go get married to my husband, you have a child with my husband that's going to be our child. It's not your child, it's going to be our child. Because that's God's promise. Hagar gets pregnant, she starts rubbing it in. I'm in a better spot than you are. I have what you want. Which creates even more frustration and anger on Sarah's part and so she starts mistreating Hagar hurt people hurt people and what does God do God sends Hagar back to Abraham and Sarah why does God do that I think it's because Hagar needed to own her part of the problem because God saw not only who Hagar was but who he wanted her to to be and for Hagar to be who God wanted her to be she had to go back sometimes sometimes to go forward we've actually got to go back because there's a lesson that we need to learn there's some character development some Christ likeness that needs to take place in our heart and life that we need to address or we won't really be able to move forward and see what God wants us to see. Because he sees us not only for just who we really are, but who he wants us to be. He is El Rai. In Matthew chapter 10, and I won't have it on the, the screen. Actually, I do have it on the screen, but just a moment. Jesus is sending out his followers, knowing that they're going to face all kinds of things. Knowing that their road ahead is is not going to be easy. Knowing that their lives would be in danger. Knowing that there would be times that they would feel all alone. That they would uh, be overwhelmed. That they would be full of fear and despair and discouragement. And he says these words to them. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. We'll come back to the birds a little later. Let's talk about hair for a moment. God sees. He knows all, right? He's omniscient. But catch how personal this is and how amazing this is. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I did a little research this week and I learned that the average person has about 100,000 hair follicles on their head. And some of you are looking around and going, nah, maybe maybe 50,000 if you're lucky, if they're lucky, right? 
okay? But 100,000 on average hair follicles for the average person, right? Okay? Do you know how many people call this ball of dirt home? About 8 billion people. Who's good at math? Take 100,000 and multiply that by 8 billion. Take 100,000 times 8 billion. It's more than 800 billion. Okay? There's like 14 zeros behind it. Okay? It's a huge number. Now some of you are saying... But you said a average is 100,000, okay? Which actually makes it even more difficult to keep track, right? Because there's a lot of different numbers. You can't just multiply it out. You've got to look at each one. 93,748. I counted them last, yesterday. If you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property that I want to sell you as well. But there's different numbers. Everybody's got a different number. And here's the thing. Every day your number is different. On average, we lose 50 to 100 hairs per day. Some days you lose closer to 50. Some days you might lose closer to 100. Some days it might be over 100. When you're really stressful or going through different things with hormones or whatever, you can lose even more hair. You might have somebody come along with some tweezers and take a chunk. Like 93,700 and what's uh, minus three? Okay. But we lose now. And, but Jesus wants us to know God is El Rai. He's the one who knows the very number of hairs on our head. That's amazing to me. He, he sees He sees me. He, he knows how many hair I have. He knows how many hair you have. That's how intimately he sees us. So what, what do we know about? What can we learn about El Rai? What does this mean for us? What does this name, El Rai, what does it name, what does it mean for me? Well, well, let me ask you a question. What would it mean for you to hear your name in place of Hagar, where God essentially says, Hagar, I see you. What would it mean for you to hear your name in Hagar's place? Matt, I see you. Paul, I see you. Nelda, I see you. Like, that does something, right? Now, when I say it, you're like, oh, I got to pay attention. But when you hear God say, I, I see you, what, what, does that, what does that do for you? Well, let, let me ask you another question. What does it say to you that God knows the number of hairs on your head? Here's, here's what it, what did you say? help him okay here's what it should mean here's here's what his name should mean to us and, and I'm going to make it personal because this perhaps is the most personal name for God for us to know him by because Hagar learned he's he's the God who sees me and so here's what I want you to know. And if you're taking notes, write this down. And if you're not taking, this, taking notes, file this away, but not so far back that you can never get to it. You matter to God. That's what El Rai means. You matter to God. You may feel like your life doesn't matter. You may feel like nobody sees you. You may have been told by others, either verbally or non-verbally, that you don't matter. 
because you don't look like this, because you can't do this or you can't do that, whatever the case may be. But too many people believe the lie that if they don't have this or can't do that, they're useless or less than. They go through life feeling like they don't really matter. And when it comes to humanity, hear me, every life matters. You matter to God. That's what Hagar learned. In a very desolate place, when her heart was even more desperate and desolate and feeling alone, God came to her and said, you matter to me. And so when we look at this name, El Rai, may we know that you mean something to God. What you experience matters to God. There's a contemporary Christian band called For King and Country. And they have a song called Matter. I want to share some of the words. Powerful. It says, all of the dreams that haven't come true and all of the hurt that happened to you, it matters. I hope you know it matters. You felt the pain of a bitter defeat where the weight of the grief is more bitter than sweet. It matters. I'm telling you, it matters. To the one who spoke and set the sun ablaze, to the one who stopped the storm and walked the waves, to the one who took the tree so he could say, you matter. I hope you know you matter. I know it's not easy, not saying it's fair, but close as a prayer, somebody cares. You're a treasure. I hope you know you're treasured. So hold your head high, wait for the dawn, keep hanging on. Your sadness will turn into laughter. Watch it turn into laughter, yeah. So let the water spill from your eyes, let it wash the wounds of those lies. Oh, let the water spill from your eyes, all that you are, all that you'll be. Someone put the beat in your heart so that you'll see you matter. I hope you know you matter. Every name of God means something. But for some of you, this, this hits different. This name of God means something to you because it declares that your name means something to God. And that's powerful. El Rai, the God who sees. Sevilla Martin wrote another song, a song that was written long before for King and Country would sing, It Matters. She wrote a song about El Rai that clearly comes from the passage that we just looked at in Matthew. And while given the backstory of the song, she wrote this. In the spring of 1905, my husband and I were in Elmira, New York, and she goes on to talk about a friendship that they had with Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle. True saints of God, she declares. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for 20 years. Her husband was an incurable cripple who had to propel him to work in a, wheel, in a wheelchair. And as Sevilla and her husband, a, a, a Baptist pastor, would visit the Doolittles, they were struck by their attitude. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. And one day while they were visiting the Doolittles, her husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked the, them the secret of their lives, the secret of their, their happiness, their joy. And Mrs. Doolittle's response was simple. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Sevilla Martin went home, and sometime later, she penned these words. And some of you know the old song. For others, it may be new, but here's just some of the words, and we're going to sing this as we close in a moment. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, 
but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. May you know El Rai. May you know there is a God who says, who declares to the world, you matter. You matter. So Father, as we sing one final song, may we know in our hearts that we matter to you. That you are the God who sees us. May we be filled with peace as you told your disciples, do not be afraid. May we have the opposite of fear. May we have peace. Because you're the God who sees. You are El Rai. And you are worthy of our praise. I pray this in and for your name. Amen. Stand with me if you're able as we sing His Eyes on the Sparrow.